So what it means to know yourself is, well, first, uh, understanding if you have a diagnosis and how it impacts you, because knowing yourself uh, means understanding not only your strengths, but also your opportunities for improvement. And I think this is another big matter in the autism community. We tend to focus too much on one person's strengths without fully addressing where the person can improve, and they make the same mistakes over and over again, possibly undoing the progress of their strengths. On the same token, we focus too much on where one person falls short and where they keep failing. They may never know where they can truly thrive and what they're really good at. And on a side note, this is why I don't use terms like high functioning or low functioning and why those kinds of terms need to go. Because when you call someone high functioning, makes or it might increase the risk of them becoming arrogant. I don't need help. I'm high functioning. And it dismisses their needs and their struggles because they probably need help too. And on the same token, low functioning, you call someone that name, it dismisses their strengths and capabilities. And no one wants to be called that kind of name. Mm-hmm. So so yeah. knowing your knowing yourself means understanding your strengths and Opportunities for improvement, and that's a Toastmasters term, opportunities for improvement. When we get our speeches evaluated, we look at how we can do better. And both subjects, both areas get addressed versus one or the other. So that's part of knowing yourself and understanding who you are as a person and pursuing more knowledge and acting on that knowledge. So what does it mean to love yourself? Part of loving yourself is accepting who you are as a person and your diagnosis. Like I mentioned with my mother and even people on the spectrum themselves, they think, no, I don't have an autism diagnosis. I forget that. And also understanding that once you love yourself, others are going to love you in return. I I think too many people on the spectrum are waiting to be loved, but don't love themselves first. So how can they expect the love that they seek to come when Deep down, they're not loving themselves. So mm. part, so loving yourself is also the importance of saying no, establishing and enforcing boundaries, understanding what you will and will not tolerate, and protecting your time, your energy, and your peace of mind. Those are critical elements to loving yourself. Yeah. Seeing that you have what it takes, you are very much worthy and capable of love. This is another stereotype in the autism community or what people might think that people on the autism spectrum don't love or are not capable of that feeling or unable to form and maintain relationships or get married and have children. There's so many families out there that have someone on the autism spectrum. And even I've seen The Good Doctor recently, the the TV show on ABC. Spoiler alert, Sean, the doctor on the autism spectrum and his girlfriend are expecting a baby they're following that journey that sean the doctor is going to be a father it's incredible that they are exploring they've talked about his employment struggles his relationship struggles finding a girlfriend now he has one and they're expecting so Mm -hmm. it is possible for people on the autism spectrum to have love to have relationships to have families and futures Mm -hmm. but it'll only work if you love yourself first Got it. And the last part of your mantra, be yourself, you know, it got me thinking about how many people with autism, especially younger people, tend to mask their autism so that they can fit in socially. So how have you learned to be yourself over the years? And be yourself is a huge step in authenticity, being who you are versus wanting to please others. And, and we mentioned earlier in this podcast about like parents wanting the best for their children or children answering to their parents. And the biggest be yourself step for me ultimately was stepping away from doing my mother's bookkeeping. Because even though I left mm-hmm. accounting, I still did her bookkeeping on the side. But I had to put my foot down and tell her, I'm not meant for this. This is not what I want. I have to go do what I want to do. And once I really let go of accounting, because accounting is not me. I am not accounting. I am meant to do speaking, coaching, consulting, and so much more than 
this number crunching. And she was resistant. She's like, no, we have, you help your family out. And she even accused me of having black and white thinking. That's common in the autism community. Like we have black and white thinking one way or the other. So I shot back out of improvisation. Thank you, improv Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. Speaking of black and white thinking, accounting to me is like being in the black market. While it's fast, big money, I shouldn't be there. And I feel like crap during and afterwards. <laughs> and I think that hugged enough on her heartstrings to let me go. Mm. So mm -hmm. I had to speak up for myself and I had to realize what I really want and pursue what I truly feel I am meant to do in this lifetime. Walk away from something I am no longer wanting to be a part of. That mm -hmm. is being yourself, existing in a way that helps you become your best self. Yeah. So you mentioned your TEDx talk earlier, and we'll post a link to it in our show notes. Um, and in that talk, you spoke about your ex-girlfriend who resisted services because she didn't want to change. So can you talk about that distinction that you made between be yourself and be your best self? Awesome question. So to give a little bit of context to this relationship, I knew this woman long distance she was from illinois just like me and the same aunt who is the autism specialist introduced me to her we both loved star wars and that was the foundation for our long distance friendship we were pen pals for about 10 years we'd see each other at christmas time when the family and i would visit relatives in illinois after about 10 years of knowing each other we became a couple she said she liked me i hadn't really thought of her as girlfriend material, so to speak. But I thought, all right, let's give this a shot, see where it goes. And she proceeds to move out to California with me into the condo that I live in now. And shortly thereafter, I realized she's missing a lot of uh, some of the basics, so to speak, because she's in her mid-20s, had never had services her entire childhood. And my mother and I are getting help for her, a lot of services that worked for me, like speech therapy, a job coach, someone to help with college and navigating college. And she calls her mother back in Illinois, who's also on the autism spectrum to explain the help she was getting. And the mother responds, they're looking to change you. Don't let them. And my now ex-girlfriend thought that my mother and I were looking to change her and was resisting the help. And I wanted to give her some time. I think maybe she'll come around. It took me years to become who I am. I'm going to give her some time. After four years and me turning 30, I realized I don't want another four years of this. And I ended the relationship. And as she's getting ready to move back to Illinois, she says, it's a shame you guys wanted to change me this whole time. I like myself the way I am. And what she and her mother misunderstood was that my mother and I were not looking to change her. We wanted to help her get the services and the support she needed to help her live the life that she wanted. She wanted to be a graphic designer. This help that she was getting would help her get that, but she didn't see it that way. And this is another big matter in the autism community that all those allies, as we call them in Come to Life, parents, teachers, therapists, people on the spectrum are thinking or have that misconception that these people want to change them versus help them get what they want. So... What needs to happen is the allies, the parents, the teachers, the therapists need to explain to the young person on the spectrum that the help they're getting is going to help them get what they want. Make it about the young person and their goals. They have goals. They want to do something. Help them meet them and that these services will help them get there. When that is concretely, directly, and explicitly explained, then hopefully – the person on the spectrum will be on board with the services and start to see the value in them. Yeah, that is a really good point to make. And I think a lot of professionals in the field skip over that. We question what is socially significant, yes, but I think without that missing piece of connecting it to what the long-term goal is of that person, then you know, the lack of cooperation might not help them get to where they need to be, either quick enough or maybe even at the level that they could achieve. 
and even something as basic as uh, social skills. Like for example, when I was a kid, I wanted to have a girlfriend and my mother got me into social skills classes. I'm like, well, I don't want to go to these classes. But she reminded me, you want to have a girlfriend, don't you? I'm like, yeah. She said, well, these social skills classes will help you get a girlfriend. I'm like, all right, I'll go. So connect the dots. Show that what you're doing to help this person will help them get what they want, live the life that they want, and that will hopefully put them on board. Yeah. And this actually kind of ties back to your previous episode on this podcast, Tom, where we were talking about requesting accommodations at school and at work. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like you need to first acknowledge and be aware of what your needs are and then know that when you that speaking up for them and asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weakness at all. If anything, it's a sign of strength to ask questions. Even Einstein, who's believed to be on the spectrum, asked questions. And there was a time where I thought I had to know everything, or if I asked questions, it meant I was stupid. But the reality is I was stupid if I didn't ask questions, if I didn't ask for help. And you're right, when it comes to college or on the job in particular, the the problem seems to be that someone doesn't know their diagnosis, they don't know how their diagnosis affects them, and they don't know what accommodations are available. So as a result, they fail their tests, they drop out of college, they fail on the job, they get fired or quit because they haven't gone through that valuable and imperative process of self-discovery to understand who they are, what they need to succeed, and how to go get it. Mm. So once we go through this prequel to transition, this process of self-discovery, then the outcomes are going to get better. And of course, you know, the younger you get on this journey of self-discovery, the quicker you'll have access to a better quality of life. But do you see some clients who are older who are still going through that self-discovery phase? Very much so. And it's an ongoing process too, because at different times in our lives, we have to reevaluate who we are, what we want, and where we're going. And I have a client, for example, who has several engineering degrees, but because of the way the economy has been or his social communication difficulties, he's having to be a barista at a Starbucks. Not that there's anything wrong with Starbucks baristas, but he's told me he wants more. He wants to go after something bigger and greater for himself. So he and I are in talks with him about starting his own coding business or starting to teach courses about coding and engineering. So he's becoming more financially and personally independent for it. And when we help young people find their niche and help them pursue what they really like and how they can create value for others rather than adhering to a corporate structure or a job that doesn't make their heart sing, then their life gets better. Then they make a change and a difference in the world. Very cool. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comments section. Click here to watch this interview in its entirety. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.